Good evening and welcome to Empowerment with Elysia. Tonight on the show, I have my dear friend, Jen Fox, originally from Louisiana, now located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Jen is on a mission to empower people to embrace and explore their sensuality in the form of boudoir photography and erotic photography. She is a fire dancer and just really an incredible dancer in general. I love getting to dance with her at fun events. She is a queer woman on a, like her journey to be a single mother by choice which I just think is such a beautiful thing for her to step into that empowered space with her incredible community. She practices polyamory and she is just, she's an incredible photographer. I've seen her work over the last year. And let me tell you, I, it is such a treat for me to get to be here with my friends tonight to share some of her journey with you as we talk about many of those subjects. So Jen, thank you again so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much. God, that was such a lovely intro. Like, can we do that every morning, <laughs> please? Because that just felt amazing. I'll just Thank like you. record it. Be like, Jen, I'm going to call you. Don't pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> oh, yes. So Jen, like, where would you like to start in your journey? Like, maybe just how did you get into photography to begin with? Let's start there. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. I, that's, you know, that's such a hard question to answer because it's so ambiguous. I mean, I got my first camera when I was like, I don't know, maybe six years old or something. Oh, wow. It was this little pink, um, 120 film, like square, skinny, rectangular camera. And I would just take pictures of whatever and then send the film off and get it back a week or a month or a year <laughs> later. You know, it was my parents were the ones developing it at that time. Right. And then it just never really went away. But whenever I was, I don't know, maybe around like 20 ish, um, it resurfaced again in a bigger way. And I got a digital SLR and then just started getting inspired, inspired by it. And eventually I was like, you know, I really want to go to school for photography. And then I went to school, um, LSU, Louisiana State University, and studied fine art photography. And the only thing that I wanted to photograph when I was in school, like every single project of mine pretty much, was fine art nudes of women. And then eventually someone came up to me and was like, oh, have you heard of boudoir photography? Because you'd be really good at it. And at this point, it wasn't really a thing. This is like, we're talking 15 years ago, I think. And I was like, no, what is that? And then I looked it up and there was a company in California doing it. And I was like, holy shit, I can do this for a living. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> <"Is that laughs> <so loud?" laughs> but I was like, yeah, this is the best thing ever. I am definitely, definitely looking into this. And that was it. Like I've never looked back since. And at first I started doing like, what the other company was doing. And I felt like I needed to be smaller in what I was doing, if that makes any sense. Um, I, I did what I call bubbled gum boudoir, which is like, you know, the frilly panties and the bright lighting and the like the little cutesy pen -y kind of almost apologetic sensuality. And I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do, which is a little bit more provocative and erotic because I felt like people would I don't know, shame me for it or just be yeah. like, oh my God, she's a pornographer and just like excommunicate her and whatever. So yeah, it took some years before I developed my own style and got away from the bubblegum boudoir and started doing like the really edgy, shadowy, more erotic and provocative type of work. And then even a few more years before I actually started doing erotic, erotic work. So yeah. It's been a fun journey. <laughs> no, I can well imagine. And it, as a fellow photographer, because I went to school and I did like, I took photography classes from sixth grade into like three years into college. Like it was, I, I loved it so much. And um, and then my house got robbed and they stole all my camera equipment and dark equipment. And then I just never bought a super nice camera. <laughs> oh, my heart. Ouch. Yeah. And, and my wedding ring at the time. I never ended up getting married. So it's just like very symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you're not meant to do any of that. You're like, you're doing, that anyway. you're doing it. like, ah, yeah, it's fine. Um, but yeah, no, it is an interesting journey of like how we're pulled into different subjects for what we like to photograph. 
and catching the light and like bringing the person out, right? Mm-hmm. Getting to have them see an aspect of themselves that they might not otherwise really feel comfortable expressing. And that's one of the things I love about you is how you create really safe, respectful spaces for people to relax mm-hmm. and come into themselves to be able to then express themselves in a really beautiful way that's so authentic. Um, so for the people, yeah, you're very welcome. So for the people out there that might not really be able to wrap their heads as much around the sensuality and boudoir and erotic, just because it's so new for them, could you break that a le- down a little bit more from your ideas of what you're having people express for sensuality? Yeah, um, for sensuality, it's so, I personally don't have anything that I have people express it's more about like me discovering who a person is and what their sensuality is because I could very easily put people into a box. And if someone comes to me for a shoot, I can be like, this is the box that we work in. You bring this type of lingerie or whatever, and we do these poses. And then, you know, but that just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. And it's not the most productive thing to do for people exploring their sensuality too. So sensuality can be vastly different from person to person. I can have one person come in and feel so gorgeous and sensual wearing, I was going to say a potato sack, but you know. <laughs> so like, you could have like a, like a long nightgown. Yeah. A white cotton t-shirt with underwear and that's like, or sweatpants. I've done a shoot in sweatpants before and it was so hot. It was amazing. (laughs) So that's like when I work with people to find what their sensuality is, we have like a consultation beforehand and they just bring everything with them. And then during the shoot, it's like, I watch how they move and then just bring out their natural movements, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there's like a little bit of coaching and playing yeah okay. so, oh, okay. there's a lot yeah. of coaching. yeah so it's just like the draping of the fingertips or something like that or yeah and there's sexy music playing so like they can really get into it and feel feel the sensations in their body rather than just like doing the poses which uh, some of it is also doing the poses and the poses are freaking hard give <laughs> 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 you a workout but yeah, it's just um, a matter of exploring of what's already there rather than putting stuff on them. And also, I would like to make a distinction between sensuality and sexuality. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that point up. Go, well, get yeah. it, girl. Tell me. <laughs> what we're talking about right now is sensuality, not sexuality. And the difference to me in these two things is sensuality can you can be alone it can be it's mostly like internally focused like you're you're feeling the sensations of your body and you're like present in your body and you're just like really in the flow of just being you whereas sexuality is a much more like um viewer oriented state of mind so you're being sexual like touching yourself playing with yourself for the camera or for someone else or you're touching someone else or having sex with someone else or playing with someone else in that way it's more aggressive so i feel like sensuality would be more like flow and passive and sexuality could be like more aggressive and aggressive not in a bad way but just like moving forward interactive I think that's probably why it feels more aggressive because it is a more interactive exactly rather than just like feeling yourself in your own sensuality yeah I always Mm -hmm. think of sensuality as being more like slow and fluid and relaxed Mm -hmm. and connected um and sexuality can also be those things but it's just like a different it's like a shift of the energy Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. like foreplay versus fucking yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. But it is. I'll have to make this one like R-rated, like language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, speaking of fucking, brings up the erotic photography. Mm-hmm. 
And I like, how is it that you shifted into that next like level? And how do you present that to people? I'm sure that brings up like all sorts of interesting conversations and potential yep. like communication and people trying to cross boundaries. And oh yeah. How do you learn how to articulate that and hold it and all the things? Yeah. Okay. That's, that, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. We're like um, really back in. I'm like, and then this. <laughs> so the transition from boudoir photography into actual photographing sex. Um, I've never had any hangups around photographing sex. I've always been open to anything and I'm like a very sexually open person and just like, I don't know, I guess progressive in that way and not progressive anyway. Um, I never had a problem with it, but again, going back to societal expectations and thinking about what people were going to think of me, I was like, I can't do this. I can't cross this line. Even if people wanted to, I still had like my boundaries of like, you can't bring sex toys in a shoot. You can't touch yourself in a shoot. I don't photograph genitalia or anything like that, but I didn't have any problems with it myself. Right. Then I did a lot of shame work. Thank you, Brene Brown. Yes, Brene <laughs> Brown. Love her. She's yeah, I did a lot of work on shame, unpacked a lot of that stuff. And then I was just like, I don't actually have a problem with photographing any of this stuff. And people were constantly asking me, like, how far can we go? If we do a couple's boudoir session, how far can we go? Like, what if I get an erection? Like, what if this and what if that? And can we do this and can we do that? And finally, I was just like, yeah, fuck it. Why not? Let's do it let's see what happens. And we did the first shoot and it was just like, I, it, it was amazing being able to be part of a couple's passion in that way and to photograph it and to find those particular moments that I know they would love because they're just so steamy and they're just so evocative. Like what other situation can you have that is that evocative? than people having sex. It's one of the most beautiful acts in the world that people can do together. It's the act of creation. It's the act of connection and love. So like, hell yeah, I want to photograph that. And I want to do a damn good job at it too and not make it look like cheesy porn. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I could do that. Yeah. So I started doing it and just, yeah, again, never looked back. I was like, yeah, okay, this is what I do now. I photograph people having sex. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, it's amazing. I don't know how this happened, but it's just the best. It's yeah, it's the best. I feel like I fell into my life in an amazing way. Like the way everything unfolded, it just feels so perfect. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And having people come into that sort of sacred space and be totally present within themselves. I'm sure initially for some people, there's some nervousness. Oh, um, almost all of my clients. I would say probably nine. Oh no, there's, I have a repeat couple that I don't think is nervous at all. <laughs> <laughs> we, have like, we have a wonderful portfolio they right experience. They don't get nervous, but <laughs> other than them, um, yeah, I think all of the people who come to me almost, except for that couple are crazy nervous because it's so different than the norm. And there's so much unknown about a shoot like this. Like you don't know what's going to happen. And there's a, especially, honestly, especially for men, because men feel like they have to perform in a certain way mm -hmm. and they have a member of their anatomy that, you know, sometimes isn't always on board. So that can happen too. Like if a man doesn't get an erection during a shoot, they're like, what do I do? And I'm like, there is so much we can do without an erection. Trust me, <laughs> we've got this. So yeah, there's a lot of nervousness for everyone. I think it's interesting too, because so often in couples, just in regular relationships, regardless of photography occurring, that they struggle to articulate their desires, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And communicate about the boundaries, both from the men's aspect and from the woman's aspect. And so I can imagine that that can be a really big jump for some people who aren't great about just communicating as a couple. For in sure. the bedroom and then going to be like oh and now we're gonna shoot and what do you want me to do and what do you like me to do and yeah and that's something that we talk about before the shoot too like what are your boundaries what are your power dynamics if there are any power dynamics um are there 
excuse me, very pregnant. <laughs> yes, yeah, she showed them the belly. Oh yeah, so I am nine months very pregnant. pregnant. Do any moment, the baby can literally like be born right now. My water can break right now. <laughs> like what, right now. <laughs> Please, please, please. <laughs> It'd be like the best interview story ever. <laughs> right? I would totally be done with that. That would be awesome. <laughs> and then we would have it on video too. We would. We would be like, and this is the moment that Jen's water. <laughs> <laughs> totally lost track of what I was saying. So yeah, you were you were talking about the couples and the conversations and boundaries oh. and power dynamics and stuff like yeah. that. Are there any poses that are off limits? And so we talk about all that beforehand. And then I give couples the option of um, basically me being a fly on the wall and just photographing what happens or me being the director and getting people like in poses that work really well for the camera and with lighting and all of that stuff. Yeah. And usually it's kind of a mix, like since people come in and they're so nervous, I'll, I'll start them off. So everyone comes in and they're fully clothed. And then I have them like slowly tease each other out of their clothes and unbutton the shirts and pull them off. And, and then like slowly get into more and more provocative poses. And then I encourage them to take it wherever they want. So then eventually by the end of the shoot, I'm, I am just a fly on the wall, but you lost in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then a lot of my couples have told me that they have had an incredible relationship changing experience because whenever they were in the shoot, they did things with each other that they've never done before. And it's, it slows it down in a way that couples aren't used to because the shoot typically, I allot like around two hours. I don't really time the shoots because it's gonna take how long it takes. Sure. Um, but it's a very drawn out process. It's not just like, let's get to it and get done. <laughs> There's a lot of foreplay. So I've had like, couples kiss up each other's leg from the toes all the way up the inner thigh. And they've never done that before. They've never slowed down to that degree. So that's something that's really fun that I know that I can like, I don't know, help couples in that way. Kind of like a sex therapist, but a and lot she's more really sex coaching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's integrated in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Switching through photography here. Um. <laughs> but not hands-on. I said hands-on. I didn't mean actually hands-on. Yes. <laughs> I do not get involved. I was going to say, speaking of which, I'm sure that over the course of the time you've been doing this, that you've had people proposition you. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And how do you manage that entire situation? Um, I say, no, I don't get involved. Professional boundaries are very important to me. It is on my website under the erotic section. Um, there's sections that say what I will do, what I won't do. And that's part of it. So if people are, um, it depends how they approach me. If people are respectful about it and just kind of like, you know, I mean, no offense by this, but my wife and I were just curious, would you be willing to join us? Then I'm like, no, that's my line. I don't do that. And then we move on. Right. Um, if they're more aggressive with it, we're not shooting. If they're, if they're already crossing boundaries before we do the shoot, that's not a situation that I'm going to put myself in. Cause that is, that could be very risky for me. And also I'm just like, I don't really deal with people who don't respect boundaries. So you're here to that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <Good> luck. <laughs> Cause not a lot of people do this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's good that you're able to have those conversations and really just like, own the space and because part of it too, I think it's so important to be able to have all parties feel all safe, including yourself yeah, and respected. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It did take me a little while to get to that point. Um, and to also know when people were pushing my boundaries, because a lot of people, part of the experience for them is just the talk about it. And they don't actually have any plans on booking a shoot. They just want to talk about booking a shoot and all the things they want to do. And I'm like, mm, no that's a waste of my time. But initially before I kind of like really got my footing in this industry, I had a little bit of a harder time saying no. I was a lot more apologetic. I didn't have a strong voice. So I'd be like, oh, sorry. No, it's not really something that I do. And now I'm like, nope, don't do that. And if you say it again, this conversation ends. So I'm a lot more like firm in my voice now <laughs> than when I started. 
No, that's really cool that you and they're like so just watching the transition as you've become more and more empowered and like stepping into your space. And and now you're even transitioning into a new business plan since like you're very pregnant. You're about to have your beautiful little baby girl in a moment. And so along yeah. that sort of vein, your yeah. new idea is so um I'm so excited about this. Yeah. All this nesting energy, nesting is a thing. It is definitely a thing <laughs> and it's coming out sideways and <laughs> making me do crazy things while nine months pregnant, like start a new business. Um, so the business is called the Fox Den and the idea is it's going to be a private sex consultation business. So there's no brick and mortar store that you can walk into. Um, and it's not just an online sales thing, but I want to do like either one-on-one, two-on-one, three-on-one consultations with solo people or couples or triads or polycules. And also I want to do um, parties. So like bachelorette parties, divorce parties, whatever, swingers parties, maybe <laughs> whatever kind of parties. And I want to bring all of my gear and all of my products to demonstrate. Um, I don't mean demonstrate on me no, or on yeah. people. We, we mean like they're out for you to, for instance, like over oh, a six toy that has different settings and vibrational quality yes. to yes. like hold on to it and see you what that feels like. Feel the, the material and the girth of it and all of that. Because most of the time, especially here in Charlottesville, when we're buying sex toys, we're buying them online because there's one place that exists and I'm not going to name them, but there's a place that exists and no one loves them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I don't feel like it's the right place. Yeah. So this gives people the opportunity to be in a safe, comfortable environment and to like put their hands on all of these different toys and implements to see what they feel like. Because when you're shopping for something online, six, uh, excuse me, six inches with a 1.25 girth, like, what does that mean to you? Yeah. It doesn't or, mean anything to yeah. most people. Or like the new rose thing with the, like the crazy long tongue on it or whatever. <laughs> long and I mean, like we're laughing about this, but it's just like <laughs> the interviews are always about like being very authentic. Right. Yeah, I love it. And, and I was just like, I bought this toy and I, and I was like, it's, 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 ter it's terrible. I hate it so much. Oh yeah. What did I do with it? <laughs> you just want me to tell this hilarious. Yeah, I do. I do. You're just going to have like all kinds of warnings. Be like, these conversation points are, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a ridiculously wonderful goofball. And if I'm going to spend money on something that I'm not actually going to get to utilize because it's too intense, like the vibration was too high, the speed wasn't the, like fast enough or whatever, like there was all kinds of things that just like did not work with this particular toy. And um, so <laughs> I was taking a bath and I was just like, well, we're just going to use it like it's a boat and we're going to see how fast it can go in the water. <laughs> I love that so much. Because, you know, if it can't be used for its original purpose, we totally need to repurpose it. And I maybe should have had like little buoys to see like, where oh my God, like, I had like little ducks or something that they like, <laughs> I didn't have any, any duckies though, to try and like see how the sex toy would swim around in the, in the bathtub. I love it. Yeah. And it uh, worked. And yeah, it did. It totally did. It floated and it was like a little rudder and it was like, <laughs> <That's> so <fun. laughs> it was hilarious. So that might be too much information for some of you out there about me. And, but, uh, you know, some people like to buy sex toys and use them and other people don't, I've been single for 14 years. So y'all need to like, give me a break. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, let's just be real about some situations. That's the thing that happens like, with most adults. Like, and yeah, not all. not all. And also there are sex toys for men, which people hardly ever talk about. Yes. And I had the most amazing and respectful conversation or thread in my men's group that has over 300 men in it about sex toys for men. And I was blown away by how vulnerable and deep these guys got in having a healthy conversation about sex toys for men and mm -hmm. how 
yeah, it was so cool. Like for some men, they're just like, I'm too big for the sex toys. And other ones are just like, I just hate cleaning them. And other ones were just like, this is weird for me and my religion. And this is, mm-hmm. I have some shame about this and how men felt about using sex toys on women. And like, you know, mm-hmm. like all sorts of things that go along with that. And I think it's really important for us to just be able to have healthy conversations with mutual curiosity to say like, hey, this is how I feel and I like this or I don't like this. Like I'm one of my ex-boyfriends that I was with for like six, seven years. He didn't like the idea of anything plastic being inside of me. And so I ended up throwing away like six sex toys. It's like hundreds of dollars, people. Oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. (laughs) And then I didn't, I didn't like have another one until like I moved here. Oh wow. uh, yeah, it was crazy. And I think I was like 26 when that happened or something. Is it because it was plastic? Yeah, like the material it, of it? Or yeah, you just didn't like this that there was synthetic material. And so I don't know if that was really the whole reason or if there was like other reasons why you didn't want me using them. Or like what yeah. what who knows? It was forever ago, like 16 years or something. And so yeah, it was just an interesting sort of thing. But like yeah. let's just have conversations and it's okay. Like it yeah. doesn't have to be for everybody. Right. It's well, to take the shame and the taboo out of it and talk about it. It's a, bo- it's a body. Like we should all get to feel pleasure all over our body, regardless of gender identification. Absolutely. Like, own what works for you, explore, and being able to have a communication cycle that if you're exploring with your partner, just like stop. When I say stop, that stop means immediately. Yeah. And, and yeah. no shame and pushing attached to that. Yeah. And it can be playful and enjoyable and be like, Hey, like, I love you. I care about you. Or if you're just like having something casual, just be like, I respect you. And thank you for telling me. And, you know, and that needs to be for both sides. The man and, yeah. like, um, I just, and people's minds it. can change at any point. Like you can have this fantasy that you've had your entire life only in your head. And then you go to play that out with a partner. And in the middle of like, playing that scene out you decide oh wow this works so much better in my head and this isn't actually nearly as sexy as I thought it would be in person cut cut scene done I never have to go back to it yeah and no feeling of guilt of like oh wow I really thought I would like that I really hyped this up with my partner and then I didn't like it like there's no shame in that no I can like being spanked one day and then the very next day be like no uh uh-uh I don't want to yeah. That goes with everything. Everything. Like, like oral sex one day and then not want to be touched the next day. And yeah, people change their mind a lot. For and lots of different reasons. It can yeah. be like, you know what? I had a really long day at work or it was hot outside and I feel sweaty and stinky. I really don't want to touch Yeah, me. that's a thing. Yeah, you know, it's going to be like 101 degrees on Sunday. I don't know how. <laughs> oh. I know, I'm sorry. I hope you get birth before that day. That's just going to be like, you probably will be here now. Before Sunday, I don't know. (laughs) Um, But yeah, and so, and in that vein, the conversation of how did you get into ethical non-monogamy in the form of polyamory? I was in a long-term relationship. And in that relationship, I just started, like, I... (laughs) I just started like, oh, I'm, I'm about to be talking about someone else right now, but I we think- We just won't use names, it's fine. What's that? Oh just yeah, no, 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 no definitely. Yeah. We don't, we don't do that here. <laughs> yeah, no, but I was in a long-term relationship with someone that I was completely, absolutely in love with. They were my best friend and amazing, just an amazing person, um, but we didn't have the same love language. Mm-hmm. We were, um, there was no touch involved and I'm a very, very touch oriented person. Yeah. And my partner was not like, did not like touch at all. So I felt like there was, I mean, this sounds dramatic, but it feels very true. I felt like there was a part of me that was dying on the inside because I wasn't getting that need met. Yeah. And, a, real um, a couple of my friends had mentioned polyamory and now in hindsight, I don't feel like I got into it for the right reasons, because if there's an issue with a relationship, that issue needs to be fixed. And I used it as a bandaid. And I'm saying that in vulnerability, because like I fucked up some stuff and we fucked up some stuff. And if I could go back, maybe I would do it different. Maybe I wouldn't, but that's how I initially got into it and started seeing other people. And also I was with a man And I am pretty straight down the middle bisexual, actually probably a little bit more queer than bi, 
but I felt like I was really lacking something, not being able to be with a woman, yeah. but then I also didn't want to just be with a woman. I wanted to be with a woman and a man. So it was like, that's, this is my only option. If I get everything I want is to right. be polyamorous. So we became polyamorous and it worked really well for a while. And then the relationship caught up with us. And I was like, you know, this is great that I'm getting my needs met in other places. And also I want to be touched by the person that I love the most Yeah. and, or not the most, it wasn't. No, I get it like that, but you know, yeah. like, I want to be touched by the people that I love. Um, and eventually we just, it didn't work and we split. And then I was like, I'm never doing that again. I'm going to be monogamous. <laughs> and that lasted for a little bit. <laughs> It's not for me. <laughs> and then you're like, wait, no. Yeah. I imagine that it takes a lot of really clear, transparent, like conversation and healthy boundaries and what are the expectations and rules yeah. for yeah. everybody to feel safe and respected and just like high levels of dialogue. Oh God. Yeah. I think, um, there's a meme somewhere that says something along the lines of polyamory is 90% talking about your relationships, 10% being in them. <laughs> <laughs> Because it does take a lot of navigation and a lot of feelings come up. I mean, just because I'm polyamorous, that doesn't mean I'm not a jealous person. Like I still have deep feelings of insecurity that come up with my partner partners and um, like, you know, shit gets weird sometimes. And I'm just like, Ooh, you did this thing. And it, I, I feel this thing and this is weird. I didn't expect to react like this, but here we are. But nine times out of 10, just talking about it makes it go away. Yeah. So when stuff comes up, it's like, in, it's absolutely imperative in polyamorous relationships to talk about everything. Because if you don't, resentment can build and then it'll come out sideways. Yeah. So whether you're talking about it initially or talking about something else later, it's gonna come up one way or another. So just nip it in the bud talk about it that makes a whole lot of sense mm. and then from the standpoint of you being queer like when did you come into that realization oh god I've never not had that realization you're just like I was born and then I I maybe I was born this and way like, like, hormones happened and I was like yes no it happened before the hormones happened so I was like oh man I started young like young I had a friend <laughs> lived across the street from my grandmother and we would experiment together yeah very young and actually it wasn't just her it was pretty much all of my 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 girlfriends when we were yay big we would like experiment and stuff and then as I got older that just never really stopped happening huh there's a little bit more shame around it sometimes and I knew I wasn't supposed to talk about it with other people yeah. but um yeah, that was just <laughs> always a thing and then hormones happened. And then that's when the boys came in. Then I was like, oh, oh, there's, there's boys here too. They're kind of, I kind of like them too. <laughs> <laughs> so it was more of a realization of like, oh, I'm also kind of straight. <laughs> I'm not, but like, also. <laughs> You're like, I have my moments, but they're mostly just moments. <laughs> well, I mean, very bi. I'm definitely never, I can never be confused for a straight person, but definitely bi. Yeah. Sure. No, I hear you. It is such an interesting journey. It's just like, I loved boys from like a very young age, like mm -hmm. seven or something like that. But then like the first sparks I ever had was with a girl and that surprised the hell out of me because like when, where I was growing up, it was not something that we talked about. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't really it was just like shamed and strange. And so for it was like many, many years, like easily into my twenties before it would ever like remotely became like something I got to actually explore. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah. And so I feel like, I don't know if, because I didn't get to experiment as much, if that's part of the reason that I have leaned so much more heavily into like dating men, or if like, if things had been fostered, if it would have been more balanced and healthy as a dynamic, yeah. So fascinating to, to know. And um, yeah. Well, it is heteronormativity is definitely a thing. Like it's definitely because of society's 
societal expectations and just the way society is set up, it is much easier, even for me, to fall into heterosexual relationships. Because also I am a bit on the shyer side and about to say overgeneralizations here, but um, men are generally more forward and more aggressive in approaching me and making things happen. Whereas if I'm interested in someone, God forbid they're shy too. <laughs> You're they like, are. Oh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen, but it's, it is much easier to fall into heterosexual relationships. Yeah everyone oh well, not everyone but like yeah but I've, I've heard that same sentiment echoed so many times throughout my friend group too it's like how do you approach a woman and also it's like oh yeah I, I'm, I'm terrible about it because I never want to offend any of my, my girlfriends because I'm so yeah. huggy yes yes I'm such a gregarious person and I've just always been a very touchy feeling like from the time I was a very small child yeah. and I would never want to make any of my girlfriends feel uncomfortable exactly because I know what that feels like like yeah. I have yeah, called and groped and sexually assaulted so many times that I'm like, I would never want to make another woman feel the least bit uncomfortable. And also like, what if she's completely straight? What if she's a homophobe? Like that would be, uh, yeah, I'm feeling it right now. Like I feel the tightness in my chest, just thinking about those interactions, which I've never had before because I don't approach people. <laughs> By the way, ladies, <laughs> you're just like, hey, I just wanted you to know, um, I'm available. <laughs> yeah, nine months pregnant. <laughs> Speaking of you being nine months pregnant and all yeah. of the beautiful things of creation, as mm -hmm. a queer single, like single mother, like what made you decide that you wanted to take that path, and how has that been working out with you for community and just your personal experience? Of what's going to happen? Oh, I love talking about this. I could talk about this endlessly. Um, so I had been in a series of long-term relationships that were going to be like my baby making relationships. And I put a lot of pressure on those relationships to make that happen because I thought that was the only way that I could make it happen. And these were heterosexual relationships right. as well. And the most recent one, when it ended, I was 35. And I was like, fuck, that was my chance. Like I am now considered geriatric in the world of maternity yep. and I don't have time. Or at that time, I felt like I didn't have time to find another relationship and then to vet them, which is for me takes about a year or two, two preferably. And then also try to get pregnant and then have a baby. And then I was like, well, I don't even know if I can get pregnant because I was 35 years old and not pregnant. Like, how did this happen? I haven't been on birth control for God since I was 23 and I'm 38 now. So can I even get pregnant? So all these questions were flowing around in my head and I wasn't torn up that the relationship ended. I was devastated that my dream had been destroyed. And then I didn't even, I didn't know that single mothers by choice was a thing. Like that's an actual movement. Um, but one day I was just thinking about it and I was like, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to figure out a way to get knocked up and have a baby. So then I started researching it and I started looking into all of the different options, adoption, which is so daunting to me and incredibly expensive. And I looked into like, you know, all the different avenues of like, do I go to a bar and get knocked up? <laughs> How do I do this? Do not tell him? I don't want to do that. Cause that's like scary. Like I need to know genetic history and all of that. So then I started looking into sperm donors and the legal courses to, to go through, to make this legitimate. And, um, I was just like, I'm fucking crazy. I am crazy. I'm so crazy. I can't believe I'm thinking about this. And then as I started to talk, talk to my friends about it, excuse me. Okay, no. <laughs> as I started talking to my friends about it and saying like, am I crazy? They were like, God, no, this makes so much sense for you. This makes so much sense for your life and the way you live your life. And because I'm, I don't live a cookie cutter life. Like I don't follow any rules. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are those? 
It's not you don't do that either. Like <laughs> I'm a very independent person and community oriented. So my friends were all like, yeah, we fully support you in doing this. So um, found a sperm donor who is someone that was in my community. And then in, I hired two lawyers, a lawyer for me and a lawyer for him. And that just like made everything legitimate and signed contracts and did the whole thing. So that states that he has no rights to the child and also he is not responsible for the child at all. So I can't go to him later and be like, I want child support because right. it's legally like the contract protects both of us. Um, and then it was time to do the thing. And I just so happened to be ovulating on my birthday, which was March 24th. This is 2020. And on March 13th, the whole world shut down and I hit my head hard and got a very serious concussion that put me out of commission for, I don't even know how long, a while. It, I'm still, I still feel it, but it's not as bad as it was, but that put my whole journey on hold for quite a while. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was like, okay, my brain is in working order. Let's do the thing. And we did the thing and I got pregnant on the first try. Wow. One insemination cycle, one ovulation. And I got pregnant. I was like, whoa, I was not expecting that. <laughs> no, definitely not expecting that. And I was pregnant for, um, 11 weeks and then I lost the baby. And that was, um, devastating is not even like there are no words in the English vocabulary that come close to the feeling of loss that I felt and also like the feeling of loss of the whole dream like is this my is it my body am I broken can I not carry a child um so that was really really hard yeah. to deal with and I grieved hard it was devastating and then I had to wait at least a month for my cycle to clear from that and um, did it again, not thinking that I was going to get pregnant on the first try again, but I did. And then as soon as I got pregnant, it just like, I don't know if I didn't wait long enough or if it would have been the case no matter what I did, but the miscarriage came back. And like, just, I was so scared for the whole first half of this pregnancy. I was terrified, absolutely terrified every single day of, am I going to lose my baby? Yeah. And I haven't, and she just kicked me. <laughs> like I'm still here, mom. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate her kicks so much, but yeah. And then that, that brings us to where we are now. I am 38 weeks pregnant. 38 years old, about to have a baby. And I feel so amazing about it because one of the, uh, well, something that I will say, one of the things that made me so confident in doing this is my community. Because if I didn't have my community, I don't think I would feel confident in having a child by myself because my family is all in Louisiana. Right. So I would be here like on my own and Jesus I know there are people out there who can do that. I'm not one of them. Like yeah. I am, I'm running a business and like, I have, I've got shit to do. And also like, I know my own limitations mentally and physically, and I know that I'm going to need help. And when I had my concussion and when I had the miscarriage, my community stepped up in huge ways and took care of everything. They fed me, they walked my dog, they did it like checked in on me constantly. They were absolutely amazing. And they're all so excited about the baby. That's awesome. Yeah. I really love hearing that. Yeah. And I'm grateful to get to be part of it. Yes. <laughs> Come hold the baby while I go take a shower, please. I totally will. I totally will. Yes, that sounds <laughs> awesome. And we live pretty close to each other. So that should be yeah. Yeah, one exit down. Yeah. So Jen, it has been so fun 
and just such an honor and a privilege to get to share this time with you this evening. Yeah. Um, is Thank there you so much. You're very welcome. Yeah, it's always fun to get to drop in and chat with you. We always go deep. I feel like every time yeah. we talk, it's, it's just what we do. We go home. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to share with the world before we wrap up? Oh, I think that's it. All right, well, I have one more closing question for you. Who in the world inspires you today? Oh, gosh. My niece. My niece is definitely an inspiration. She is uh, 12 years old. Her name is Sophie. And she was diagnosed with cancer um, in, in March. And she is amazing. She has shown me what it's like to go through something that is absolutely devastating and still keep a smile on her face and make other people laugh. She's just an incredible inspiration because she is not letting this get her down. Amazing. And it is hell. She is going through absolute hell. And she's still like walking down the hall or yeah, kind of being helped to walk down the hall and shaking her butt. <laughs> Literally. She's an amazing kid. That's awesome. We can all learn something from her. Absolutely. And she's the reason that you have no hair. That is true. Yeah. It was, uh, she was at first kind of really upset about shaving her head and then I was like no it's super cool we're gonna do this and I'll do it with you we'll do it together and then she got really excited about it and then it came time she started losing her hair and it came time to shave her head and she was like I can't I don't want to do this and then I was like I got this <laughs> so then I, I did a video of me shaving my head and sent it to her and she was like oh you look good with a shaved head and I was like <laughs> I you will too and then she <laughs> and now she's like you know I think I might keep my hair like this once I'm finished with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, me too. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the summer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing her story and sharing your stories. And it's just such a privilege. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful to chat with you. Yeah. You're very welcome. And where can people find you, my friend, if they want to ask you questions about your journey or about your photography? Yeah, um, I have two websites now, jen-fox.com. That's the one that's not, well, actually both of my websites are not safe for work. <laughs> Don't click on them when you're going, when you're at work. And then the <laughs> next one is foxdenva.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Jen Love Fox. Instagram, Jen Love Fox, and Jen Fox Boudoir and Erotica. Fantastic. All right. You heard it here first, folks. Get to go to all of those sites to get to help support Jen and her new cool business idea and her fantastic photography and talents. So if you're interested in booking with me for empowerment coaching or getting to be on the podcast yourself, please do contact me at www.globalequineaffiliates.com. So until next time, we'll see y'all later. Bye. Bye.